Last week, we concluded by looking at some of the characteristics that we've seen of disciples uh, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 6. These disciples uh, are ones who were slain for the word of God and for the witness that they bore, um, how they were focused on prayer. And, and Don, I know you brought that up um, as something to prepare us for some additional references to prayer as we move through the book. And then finally, that these were uh, um, the disciples who trusted in God's sovereignty through very difficult uh, circumstances. And now as we get into chapter seven, uh, we've seen that in this fifth seal, that a judgment is about to come. The, the martyrs are praying for that. In the sixth seal, the judgment does come. And those who are judged recognize that uh, this is a judgment of the one who is on the throne. Um, and it's, it's uh, reflective of the wrath of the Lamb. And then chapter 7, we get into uh, an entire list of uh, uh, tribes who find themselves in, um, in the presence of the Lord. Guys, what do you make of those uh, 144,000? It's easy to kind of get caught up in the imagery here and think that it must be an allusion to all the Jews who will come to saving faith after uh, all the, the tribulations begin. However, I think there's a few, uh, how shall we say, code words or, or clues rather that can clear that up relatively quickly. And for one thing, we have to remember who is this letter to? It is not to uh, Jewish believers. It is to churches that are probably a blend and, and likely predominantly Gentile. So for this to be exclusively Jewish believers, uh, not out of the realm of possibility, but not very probable. That's the first thing I would say. The second thing is that the seal on the servants of God, the seal on their foreheads, is in line with much of everything else that we read in the New Testament, at least in the trajectory of the New Testament. And I would perhaps sum that up in uh, Paul's words in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, that there is nothing in heaven and on earth, not angels nor demons, nothing that can separate us from God's love for us in Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. That this is a spiritual seal that no matter what the children of God experience in this life, no matter what tribulation they come up against and its outcome, it will not result in them losing their salvation. Uh, the other clue that we have is in the listing of the tribes. And it would be very easy to miss this. And I can tell you with great shame, humiliation, and embarrassment that I probably missed it for years. But this is not your typical list of the tribes. Yes, there are 12. Mm -hmm. But a closer examination shows, first of all, uh, 12,000 from the tribe of Manasseh. Well, we know that Manasseh was considered a half-tribe half -tribe, yeah. under Joseph, right? Joseph never appears. It's always the half-tribe of Manasseh and the half-tribe of Ephraim. Um, but Manasseh is there, but Ephraim is not. What's more, Dan is missing. Mm. We might wonder, well, why would Dan be left off the list? And, of course, Judah is put first, which if you look at Within the Old Testament, Judah is not typically listed first, but here in the New Testament, on the other side of Jesus's ascension back to the Father, Judah is listed first because Jesus comes from the tribe of Judah. But let's go back to Dan for a moment because it's an interesting uh, phenomenon. And for a while, I wonder, well, why did Dan get left off? I, I've looked at several commentaries. I can't claim to come up with this observation on my own, but uh, the one explanation that made the most sense to me was that Dan had been such a source of idolatry 
throughout the Old Testament times that Dan was left off the list. Now, I don't know if that's satisfying for, for everybody or for every question, but it does make some sense. Um, then, what's more, we see that we're going from the 144,000 witnesses into a great multitude that no one could number. And so I think that the 144,000 is not to be taken as a literal 144,000, but in fact is symbolic of the connection between God's people in what we call the Old Testament and God's people in the New Testament. It's the mm -hmm. same people. It's the same church, as it were. We need to know that uh, here's where apocalyptic literature as a genre comes to play. Are these real numbers or are these symbolic numbers? And of course, David, you'd made, you've made the case for a symbolic meaning, and I would agree with that. Uh, the other is, are these Jews or are these Gentiles or both? And you've already addressed that question. Uh, we see even later in chapter 7, a great multitude. But I would like to demonstrate the connection between uh, chapter 7 and the end of chapter 6, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that we went through five seals, and then the sixth seal is actually an answer to the prayer of the martyrs when the seal was broken, uh, when the fifth seal was broken, uh, so that we see that the wrath of the Lamb in verse 17 of chapter 6 mm -hmm. is uh, has come. It is present. And yet it is a judgment that is coming on the world, but not necessarily a judgment on Christians. And although we see martyrs under seal number five, what we see, what we see here um, is that there are a number, a great number of people who will continue to live, and I believe live physically, but certainly also they will not be subject to the second death, that is uh, the punishment of death and hell in that regard. But picking up on the uh, verse 17 of chapter 6, where he asked the question, for the great day of their wrath uh, has come, and who can stand? Mm -hmm. And we see an interesting mention in chapter 7, verse 1, of four angels standing, mm -hmm. and then we see uh, in verse 9, after this, I looked and behold a great number that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne. And then there's one other mention, and I think, uh, okay, verse 9, uh, there's one other mention close in the context here, and my eye is not landing on it, but to say that there is a continuation between chapter 6 and chapter 7. These chapter divisions are not inspired. <laughs> right. Right? And it's unfortunate because it has led many to say that this is an interlude. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure I like the word interlude, but for ha lack of a better term, I just want to say that I see that there's continuity from chapter 6 and the first six seals and going into chapter 7 before we get to the seventh seal in chapter 8. So mm -hmm. I see continuity and the answering of the question, who can stand in 617, with the answer given uh, in chapter 7. Well, thank you for bringing up that point, because I was just too excited to jump right into the 144,000. <laughs> <laughs> I, I completely forgot to mention that. But I, I think you're right on the money. Um, I'm not uncomfortable with the term interlude as long as we understand it uh, in a way that doesn't move us from the action of the ending of six and into chapter eight. I see it as kind of a close up, if you will, on some details that we might miss otherwise, were they not drawn to our attention by both John and the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. By the way, I did find the other mention of the word standing. It's in verse 11, where we return to the angels who are standing uh, around mm -hmm. the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. 
And yeah. I can't miss this opportunity to say, what does that lead to? Worship. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So there's continuity. There's, it, it makes sense here that God is saying, yes, although there are martyrs, there are some who are going to be preserved, not mm-hmm. necessarily 144,000 individuals, but a great number of people who are going to be, be preserved, even though many will be martyred as well. Mm-hmm. And so you're looking at these 144,000 or this great multitude, uh, the sum of whom will be on the earth at this yeah. time. Yes. Uh, well, we have, yet to, we have yet to come up with any uh, rapture here. So clearly, uh, there will always be a remnant. Yeah, good. And isn't that, I mean, do you just think about that? That It's beautiful to think that God is not going to leave himself without a witness on earth, Mm -hmm. even through these uh, uh, very tumultuous times that we're seeing. Well, the play on what Don was saying, it, it, in a sense, much, if not all of chapter seven is a juxtaposition to those last few verses in chapter six, you know, calling out for the rocks and mountains to hide us because the the wrath Mm. of the land is so great. Who can stand? And then the answer is chapter seven. Mm, mm. Yeah. Those, so those who are standing are those who are, are sealed. Um, And that's the only reason they're standing mm, mm. by the power of God at work. Yeah. Great. Well, beautiful uh, guys. I, I, well, that was worth our time today, <laughs> for sure. Well, Michael, I, I, I will say it, uh, but I, I thought you would say this. But you know, don't we have a missiological element going on here too? What? Mm-hmm. Why are these one hundred forty-four thousand? Why is this great multitude mentioned? Uh, because it, it we will see eventually that it has something to do with the proclamation of the gospel, mm-hmm. the everlasting mm-hmm. gospel. It's for the kingdom. You know, somehow this is central. We understand that chapters four and five, uh, not inspired, but the content under those headings uh, dictates uh, so much of what follows all through the book, uh, whether it's true worship of God or false worship of God. and. What we have here, obviously, is uh, it leads to giving God glory, worship, and praise from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, um, to, to say from the outset that God has been concerned about the nations. He is not unaware, unconcerned, and uh, so now we have in heaven, once again, in God's presence, uh, this theme of worship and giving God glory. Mm. Mm. What I like about this is, uh, and I liken it to, you know, connect the dots, is that this isn't just a connection to the previous chapter, but it goes all the way back into Genesis. Uh, in the same way that we see the reversal of the Tower of Babel beginning at Pentecost, here we see the imagery of its coming to a conclusion. Uh, And it's not just the reversal of languages as some people kind of get caught up in. Uh, This is the, the recapitulation of all the nations being brought into the kingdom. And we have to remember that Israel was God's portion among the nations, his inheritance among the nations. And originally, uh, there were angels, divine beings, who were tasked with watching over the other nations. The Lord took Israel for himself. And of course, those angels turned against the Lord. They they brought about idolatry, whatnot. But uh, what we see in these verses is the, the imagery of this great multitude, all these nations are now being brought under the the tent of Israel, 
that Isaiah refers to, that Israel's tent has been expanded to include the Gentiles, that Israel, who was the priest uh, to represent God to the nations, uh, now all these nations have been brought into the holy nation. So it's a, it's a beautiful picture that we see here, and we can easily read past it because it's uh, so strange to the rest of the New Testament that we, you know, it sounds flowery and, and uh, very quickly we get into the poetry of the, the songs here that are sung, uh, but we need to make no mistake and recognize what is happening here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I mean, that leads me, we're going to get here eventually, um, hopefully today, but that leads me into uh, chapter 10 when mm -hmm. uh, John is, uh, well, he writes, but in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled, just mm -hmm. as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Mm -hmm. And that mystery uh, must be a reference, just as Paul would reference that mystery in Ephesians chapter three and Colossians two, mm -hmm. that Christ has come to bring salvation as much for the Jews as for right. the Gentiles. And, right. and here we're, we're seeing that now. Um, I, I like to use the, the, the idea of completion uh, here, that, that here God is completing what he had set out to do uh, mm -hmm. from the very beginning to bring all the nations to worship him. Uh, I do believe that God has, uh, he has those whom he has chosen. He has a full, or, or let me put it in non, let, let me put it differently. There will be a full number of people who trust in Christ without getting into how that happens, why it happens. And I think this is where we have that complete number. The final judgment will not come until the last person trusts in Christ. Mm -hmm. Right. So the 144,000, not necessarily uh, 144,000 individuals, but a great number. And then we get that uh, in verse 13, in chapter 7, verse 13, we, we have a section here where we have revelation interpreting it itself. Mm -hmm. That one of the elders addressed me saying, who are these? That is these 144,000 mentioned who are clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? And the answer is given in verse 14. I said to him, sir, you know, and he said to me, in other words, John is saying, hey, I'd like to know the answer to that question too. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. So these are mm -hmm. ones, some would say, who have the reference to, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, is just another way of saying they have placed their trust fully in Christ. They've been sealed by the Spirit, and no harm can come to them apart from God allowing it to happen. But some will actually come through, uh, I won't say unscathed, but they will not uh, die a physical death. Mm -hmm. And notice he gives us a time placement here. We are suddenly ushered through judgments, and now suddenly we're standing at the brink, at the precipice of the final judgment. Mm -hmm. And yet this happens on a recurring basis, again with the trumpets and again with the seals. They all bring us to what looks like the cataclysmic end of the world. And God is going to be faithful. People are going to be saved. And those who know Christ and are sealed in this way are going to make it through with their lives, and some will end up on under the altar as the martyrs were in chapter six. Yes, God, God knows those who are going to be there, and it's it's also interesting. You know, again, I'm I'm getting ahead of us, uh, and I don't mean to, but you know, when we get into the seven trumpets, we revisit some of these same events uh, right. that are being described. And and we're given just a little bit more detail. And I and uh, in this regard, uh, with the sixth trumpet, um, it, the 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 tone is uh, about three and a half days. Um, it, then there's going to be great fear and so on. 
But what I love about this is in verse 13 of chapter 11, um, John writes, and at that hour, there was a great earthquake and a tenth of the city fell. 7,000 people were killed in the earthquake. Again, it, it, the number isn't to be taken literally. It's, it's figurative. There are a lot of people that are going to die from this earthquake. And then, and then he says this, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Mm-hmm. And so you get this, I mean, you just get this, or at least I do, I get this picture of a God who is relenting and relenting in order for more and more to come to know him. And yet he's at the same time trying to compel them to come to know him uh, through the course of, of these events. And um, I, it's just an incredible picture of a missionary God a God who wants to be known and, uh, and who waits patiently for more and more to come to give him glory. Well, and if I can, I'll, I'm going to transition back to chapter 7, verses 15 to 17, where we have this poetic expression of what should come out of this for those who know Christ. And this language is just filled with allusions to the Old Testament. You can find almost every phrase in this poetic section, verses 15 through 17, has some reference uh, to what is mentioned in the Old Testament and brings us again to the final purpose for which we're created, uh, to know God and to worship Him. Uh, That is the natural result. If you lived your whole life, if you went through a time of tribulation, if you trusted Christ and you were sealed and protected and you came to this point where you're on the precipice of the great judgment to come, uh, I mean, this is a beautiful picture of where it ultimately leads to. It, it leads to praise and worship uh, and to the glory of God. And when we uh, end up in chapter eight, that when the Lamb does open that seventh seal, that there is silence in heaven for about a half hour. I, I think it's, it's almost like holding your breath. Is this really going to happen? Uh, how bad is it really going to be? Well, let's let's talk about that. So they we have this picture of uh, the worship around the throne. Um, it, Don, you make reference to the the language being familiar to the Old Testament. It, it seems to me language familiar to the synoptic accounts of the the the, the events that are going to happen um, and uh, how Christ is going to care. Uh, for people. There's no more hunger. There's no more thirst. The sun will not strike them. And then there's this uh, in verse 17, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. Mm-hmm. Boy, doesn't that sound like John? Yeah. In John chapter 10, yeah. the lamb is going to be the shepherd mm-hmm. and he will guide them to springs of living water. Mm-hmm. And then this beautiful uh, line here, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Mm-hmm. I mean, that reminds me of Revelation 21, um, it, that, that, you know, that ultimate place where we will be, where there will be no more crying or, or weeping. God wipes away, away those tears. And then, the, then David, as you uh, just recounted in Revelation 8, uh, 1, uh, when the seventh seal is open, there is silence in heaven for about half an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a powerful image. All this activity, these breaking of seals, and all the judgments that have been wrought throughout the history between Christ's ascension and his near return, and then this moment of silence. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a, a real explanation given for it it's left to our imagine our sanctified imaginations i i think also of how 7 15 to 17 not only echoes themes that we and and direct words and phrases that we hear from the old testament but i wonder how it sounded to those in asia minor uh michael you've influenced me so much that i can't pass by this to say There's discussion here, mention of thrones, uh, temples, um, uh, springs of water, uh, 
their their eyes, you know, the uh, eyes being wiped of tears. But uh, some of these things that we've seen already in chapters two and three, when we read the letters to the seven churches. So there's a note that sounds that gets the ear of the person in Asia Minor and Ephesus, uh, Smyrna, and so on, that it, it gets their attention. So even the language uh, echoes somewhat what we've seen in chapters two and three, but it comes from the Old Testament, but it relates to the people who were there. And then as we cross into chapter eight and after the silence, what happens? Uh, these golden censers, remember, that had the prayers of the saints, <laughs> the, the foretaste of the wrath of the Lamb, uh, it's coming the way of the world. Um, and they're the ones that are going to be under God's judgment. So verse 4, and the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints sounds awful, awfully lot like uh, chapter 6, verse 10. Uh, rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on, on the earth. And there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And Michael, you've already referred to the earthquake in chapter 11, but we see at the end of each of the series of the septets, the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls, accompanied by this cataclysmic earthquake and thunder you know, nature is disrupted, all portraying in a portention of the coming final judgment. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I mean, it will be a overwhelming, uh, and it does even appear to be an overwhelming scene uh, here. I think it is, again, Don brought it up that here we have the answer to the prayers of the saints under the altar. How long, O oh Lord, until you vindicate us? And here is their vindication. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a, and it's a frightening image, right? I mean, surely this is not a literal censer filled with literal incense and literal fire, right. uh, but it is something of heaven coming down. And, and bringing with it the, the fire of judgment. Well, these are images that we're going to revisit at least two more times and then uh, revisit in much more detail as we get to the end of Revelation. But now we're moving to the seven trumpets, the next set of septets here beginning in chapter 8, uh, verse 6. Now the seven angels who had the seven, seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And what we see is what we've been talking about, this idea of recapitulation. John is, it seems, expanding upon or, or, or I mean, we don't want to say embellishing, but certainly uh, adding more description to, that is embellishing, isn't it? Uh, but he's, he's, he's expanding this, uh, these, uh, trumpets or these septets in, in a new way, adding more, uh, illumination, I suppose you might say to our understanding of what will take place, uh, during this time. I think to, to go back to some phraseology that we've used already, uh, you know, we've, we've borrowed generously from Grant Osborne's hermeneutical spiral. Uh, you know, this is, this is a revelatory spiral uh, that we see. And every time we come back around, we get a little closer. We can see more and more detail, as it were. We can see uh, the, the greater extent of sin. We can see the greater extent of the damage done. We can see in greater detail the, the violence of the judgment that is coming. We see this intensification. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's it is point. getting tense. In fact, you, you asked the question, what do we see? And my answer is, we don't see what we thought we were going to see. Mm. He brought us to the brink of the final judgment. And that's what I expect to come next. But instead, he says, well, he doesn't say, I'm reading between the lines. Hey, let's take a closer look at this. Right. It intensifies, and his description, you know, from the seven trumpets, 
Uh, and by the way, trumpets mentioned numerous times uh, uh, in the Old Testament could be a cause for joy and worship and celebration, or it could be a time for judgment. <laughs> or the and call to so, battle or anything. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Uh, good, I mean, Jer- Jericho should ring a bell here. <laughs> uh, but uh, well, maybe, well, they're certainly announcing something's about to happen. Yeah. And maybe I shouldn't say Jericho should ring a bell. Jer- uh, Jericho should blow a trumpet here, right? But, okay. Uh, good. So, so things get intense. So once again, we see, as we saw before, um, the political turmoil, the war here in verse seven. Uh, the economic turmoil in verse eight, uh, with with what might be thought of in in uh, regards to um, a disruption of the food supply, with the ships and uh, the the sea becoming blood. Um, it, the third angel blows his trumpet, and there's a plague uh, here, where where wormwood is thrust into the springs of the water and made it bitter. And then the culmination uh, here in verse 12 with the fourth angel uh, who blew his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that a third of their light might be darkened and a third of the day might be kept from shining and likewise a third of the night. Well, we see, you know, these first four trumpets are dealing with creation. You know, the, the physical side of things. And so all of these judgments, as you said, are going to have real world, real time ramifications, whether it is the disruption of uh, food supply, food chain type stuff, or uh, certainly economies, overall reliance on those who have set themselves up against the authority of God. I mean, to not put too fine a point on it, we need to remember that these judgments are not random or uh, without purpose. They are specifically designed to show both God's sovereignty and rebellious humanity's sinfulness and deserving, being deserving of judgment. There, there's so many things happening here, too. Uh, with respect to the first four trumpets, they echo Leviticus and the promise, the negative promises that would happen from breaking the covenant. The curses. Now, Yes, the curses. And so, in a sense, the whole world uh, is in a covenant relationship with God uh, by virtue of creation. And what we see here is the whole earth being judged. Uh, Before, only a fourth of the earth was affected. Now we see a third in every case. And is it an exact fourth, you know, one quarter? Is it an exact one third? I I doubt what I doubt that, but what I think it does communicate again, this word intensification, things are getting worse. More and more people are going to be affected by these things. And by the way, the curses in uh, Leviticus for not adhering to the covenant have to do with the judgment of war that, of course, brings on all these other things, such as. Uh, murder and violence and um, might need to, I, I thought I had them real clear in my head here. Um, yeah, f- civil unrest, uh, things, uh, the disruption of the economy, famine, and ultimately then leading to pestilence or plagues. Uh, this would be the lot of those who would disobey God and not follow his covenant what we also see is the intensification of man's depravity. You know, just when you think you've heard the last word on depravity, then it goes another step lower. And what we see is the grace of God in allowing people to continue in their way and give them more of a chance to repent. Mm -hmm. And there are those who will not repent, who will never repent, and they're even though they're called to repent, uh, and then there are those who will make it through to the end. And so then we we come from uh, the uh, the fourth trumpet in in verse twelve, uh, again fe- affecting the earth into verse thirteen, 
where we have this introduction of whoa, whoa, whoa. And uh, it's not whoa, 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 hold on, but woe is me, woe is me, you know, something terrible is about to happen. I I think it is absolutely, uh, you're right on, Don, I agree with you, and I appreciate your connecting us back to Leviticus. I think we also see connections in a very general sense to the plagues upon Egypt. Again, this is part of the... Uh, the the re uh, why can't I think of the word the uh, recapitulation of the plagues upon the the Egyptian uh, people upon Pharaoh but most of all upon the the deities which I think ushers us into chapter nine um, and the, the the different angle the the spiritual angle that comes with that. And maybe, although you just said it in general terms, that this takes us back to Egypt and the plagues before the Exodus, but the first trumpet, there was hail mixed with fire, Mm -hmm. uh, which happened, which was one of the plagues. Uh, Then we have uh, the second trumpet being blown and the sea became blood. We know the Nile was turned to blood. So there's not an exact correspondence, but you can see the author is influenced by Mm -hmm. his reading and knowledge of the Old Testament uh, that also happens to the waters, the fresh water. And then we get into the fourth trumpet where there is darkness, Mm -hmm. uh, which was also one of the judgments. Right. Michael, take us to the woes, if you would. Yeah. So three woes are uh, introduced in, uh, well, they're first introduced in chapter eight, verse 13. And then as we get into Chapter nine, uh, the uh, fifth angel blows his trumpet and a star falls from heaven to earth. And he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. And here it goes on. I think, you know, what's interesting to me about this, and I want to talk about who this person is that falls from heaven to open the bottom bottomless pit. But I'm struck here again by uh, the the fact that uh, whatever is going on, the church seems to still be present. Uh, Mm -hmm. Verse four, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree, but only those people who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And so those who, again, we meet this idea, David, that you introduced uh, at the at the beginning of the, this group of people who have been sealed. There's something that distinguishes them uh, here. Well, and that's, I think, what, what the difference is between the first four trumpets and these last three, the first four were physical. So very much the church would likely have been affected by these in, in every way. But when we shift to the, the spiritual, the cosmic, the way these things affect, uh, they will only affect those who have not been sealed for God. And so, the 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 terribleness and these, and these are perhaps uh, some of the ugliest uh, judgments to come out of this whole thing. These little uh, or maybe not so little locusts that have scorpion tails and and uh, lions faces or something like that. You know, they're they're a bit of a chimera of sorts. And uh, just imagine the horror and the terror of seeing something demonic because that's what these are uh, coming out and, and just being unleashed on people who are in no way, shape or form ready for them. Mm, But it is a a just punishment on an unbelieving world. Michael, you mentioned in verse four of chapter nine, uh, but only those people who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads, uh, clearly taking us back to the 144,000. 
but we also have an Old Testament echo there from the prophet Ezekiel, who had a vision and was to take uh, the, the marking tool out of the hand of the one who held it and to put a mark on the forehead of those who were uh, God's people. And so, again, we have this constant back and forth and these images uh, telling us what's happened. So, Michael, did you want to deal with the identity of the person who has the uh, the key to the uh, bottomless pit? Yes. Who the is key, that person? The, the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. I, I think about uh, what Greg Beale writes in his shorter commentary on Revelation, drawing our attention to Jesus's words to the disciples after they had returned from casting out demons and proclaiming the coming of the kingdom, that uh, Jesus's words in Luke 10, 18, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Uh, I don't know that this would be Satan. Uh, it, it's a very thin clue. And so I'm not necessarily comfortable saying that this is Satan. However, uh, we do know that any enemy agent is ultimately working under God's sovereignty, whether that is a, a general permission or an allowance to do what they are purposed to do, uh, much in the same way as uh, Jesus sent Judas out of the upper room, you know, go and do what you uh, are purposed with doing. Uh, I don't think we get enough clues in the text to give us uh, an identity. But we do get a better sense of the identity of who's down in the pit with all those <laughs> nasty scorpion-tailed locust things. Yes. Um, I, I think that's the wise approach to take here. It would be an argument from silence to say that it was a certain sort of angel from God or otherwise to say that it was a fallen angel from Satan. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I follow that logic, uh, why would a malevolent being who had was given the key? Uh, yeah, he was given the key. Yeah. So I guess it could be malevolent or benevolent, but it sounds like uh, the good guy gave the bad guy the key. It uh, doesn't become any more clear as we get on in the passage, although um, we will, of course, meet more explicitly a, a reference to Satan in uh, chapter 12. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I agree with you guys. I don't think there is necessarily a parallel here to this, whoever this fallen being is, as being uh, Satan himself. But um, I, I, I tend to agree that this appears to be a malevolent being. Um, someone who is uh, coming to bring uh, some sort of uh, punishment, if you will, or disaster upon uh, people on on the earth in different ways. Um, and, and I don't know that verse 11 uh, gives us any more clearer picture of who that being is, although there have been references or speculation at least who, uh, the the uh, reference is to the person in chapter 11. So John writes, uh, they have as king, uh, talking about these scorpion uh, the, uh, creatures, um, uh, over them, the angel of the bottomless pit. Um, uh, let me read that one more time. They have as king over them, the angel of the bo bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abdadon. Abdon, and in Greek, he is called Apollo, Apollyon. Um, it, those who are looking at this, uh, particularly those who are from a preterist uh, position or who might date the book early, uh, see this as a reference to Nero, um, that he is the uh, one who is coming out of the bottomless pit uh, returning as a king. Interestingly enough, um, there was a myth that began to circulate very shortly after Nero's uh, suicide uh, that he was going to be resurrected. Uh, there wasn't a myth propagated among Christians, obviously, 
it was a myth propagated among uh, the, those who followed Nero. They believed that he would be resurrected. And so this might be an allusion to that. Uh, and why Nero? Well, um, it, there have been those who suggest, uh, um, such as uh, Seneca and others, that uh, that Nero had an affinity with Apollo and um, as being a destroyer. And so, um, so they draw the conclusion that John is making an allusion here to that myth of the resurrected Nero. You know, again, the text does not give us any direct clues to that end, but certainly uh, Nero's penchant for uh, destroying is is well known in terms of him, in the very least, allowing half of Rome to burn and then turning around and blaming it on the Christians. Um, yet, there's also a connection here by, by saying that this is the angel of the bottomless pit. We're also linking this back to Second Temple uh, writings, the angels that were in rebellion against God, who were locked up until the time of judgment. Uh, we see this as being connected to that. And John would certainly have been familiar with that literature as well. The description of the locusts uh, should also remind us of Joel, where he mm -hmm. prophesied of a uh, plague of locusts. It should also remind us of the uh, the the plagues in Egypt mm -hmm. in which uh locusts were a part of that but but now I'll refer to uh an arab tradition and i'm picking this up from a commentary who writes that a man named nebor in the year 1772 reported an arab's depiction of a locust and so here's how a, a common arab described the locust he compared the head of a locust with the head of a horse, its breast with the breast of a lion, its feet with the feet of a camel, its body with the body of a snake, its tail with the tail of a scorpion, its antenna with the hair of a maiden. Mm. Now, it's interesting. I just have to put myself in this setting and be this man, Nibor who is talking with a, a common Arab, and he asked him, tell me about the locust. <laughs> now, I remember back to the early days in the very early 70s uh, when a book came out describing these beasts, and they're associating them with some sort of genetic mutation of all these that are the size of horses or that have these uh, armor-like characteristics associated with the military. And then I compare that with this, with this Arab description of the locust, and I think, okay, you know, he's pretty imaginative. He spent a lot of time watching uh, sheep and herding goats, and he's had chance to observe the locust, and this is what he thought. Okay. Uh, then the same uh, commentator, George Beasley Murray, goes on to make the association of the cult of Apollo uh, used the symbol of the locust. And the emperors Caligula, Nero, and Domitian claimed to be incarnations of Apollo. So, I mean, I find this very interesting, connecting the, the background of Asia Minor, the references in the Old Testament, the references and the obvious knowledge that they have of the history of the, the Roman cult, the emperor cult, as well as false worship in Asia Minor, it, it makes me think that these locusts are locusts. Plain and simple? Locusts, yeah. I mean, they create tremendous damage. And if you read the section in Joel, let me see if I can bring it up real quick. Yeah, in Joel, he says, he's talking about locusts and the plague that will come. And he describes them like this. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses. And like war horses, they run. I mean, in other words, they move quickly. Mm -hmm. 
as with the rumbling of chariots. I mean, that they sound like chariots coming. They leap on the tops of the mountains. You can see them coming over the mountains like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble, like a powerful army drawn up for battle. I mean, there is nothing that is going to stop them. And before them, peoples are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. They march each on his way. They do not swerve from their paths. They do not jostle one another. Each marches in his path. They burst through the weapons. I mean, I mean, have you seen these depictions of the great dust bowl and the locusts that came through then? Mm-hmm. And just the horrible effect on the earth, but also on the people as they came through. I, I'm leaning more and more to the to the conclusion that these are just locusts. That I don't think it's a vast army of some sort coming through from the north or something like that. Right. Okay, that's, I thought that was a great insight from George Beasley Murray. Well, the question then is, you know, what do we make of their tails and stingers that have the power to hurt people for five months? Mm. Yeah, and it, 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 um, and this is one of the challenges we face when we're trying to interpret this type of literature. Um, do we remain consistent in terms of this being imagery? Uh, when do we decide it's imagery and when do we decide it's literal? Um, and so those are a lot of the interpretive challenges here. Mm-hmm. And, and this is one of the more challenging parts to interpret, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a fair question. Um, you know, my first thought was, are these hybrid locusts that also have stingers? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I guess what I'm saying, I'm I'm sort of kicking against that idea that was the first one I ever heard when I was uh, mm-hmm. uh, when I was a you know a young man. The, the mutated heard, locust. Yeah, mutated locust, the size of horses that have the strength of a tank and you know fierce as lions. So what? But but what's the big point here that, that we're seeing? I mean, we can get uh, really lost in the yeah. images, but what what is it that John's trying to get across? What is it if you were one of the seven churches? What is it that you would be hearing him say? Well, again, this is this is part of the the spiritual side of judgments, right? So the demonic is being released. Uh, in a sense, it, it's like God saying, okay, you, you don't want my authority over you? Fine. Have, do not have my authority over you. But this, there's no vacuum. It's not in your ability to step in and take on my authority. If it's not going to be my authority, then you're going to deal with the spiritual authority of, of those who hate you. Mm. And I think clearly they're going to hear there is a plague coming from God, or certainly at the very least allowed by God. And the purpose of it is for you to repent and to turn, Mm -hmm. to return to God, to worship him. Uh, And you are called to account. And... Mm. I, that I think that's the message they're supposed to hear. Does it come in the form of locusts and a terrible locust plague? Does it come as a result of an army on horses? But I don't know. But they're they they are to hear that there is a plague coming, and the proper response is to repent. If you repent, then you're not going to fall prey to these to to this plague. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and I—I I mean, I along with that, I just hear um, that John wanting the churches to be encouraged. Yes, the times are going to get difficult, but there's a promise here. Uh, those people who uh, are sealed are yes. not going to be harmed by this. You're going to go through difficult times, but ultimately, you come out the other side. Um, and I think there's a, a voice of encouragement in this text as well. And he speaks of what he himself has experienced to some degree, right? I mean, in a sense, we're hearing a voice of, of 
wisdom and experience. I have walked with the Lord all my adult life, and I have experienced persecution and tribulation and all these things. And God is faithful. He's gotten me this far. He will carry you this far as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And even along with that, David, I mean, we sometimes um, forget that John experienced famine. Uh, mm-hmm. The Acts recounts the, the famine uh, in Palestine. Mm-hmm. Some have suggested that that famine was the result of a, a plague. And so mm-hmm. it could very well be that John experienced plagues as well. And, and all God, through it, he got yeah. through it. Yep. Well, and, and God may have used that to move John to Asia Minor. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. Yeah. Good. Verse 12. The first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. And then we get to the sixth angel who blows his trumpet. And John says, I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horse in my vision. And those who rode them, they wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horse is in their mouths and in the, their tails, for their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. Again, another fantastic image that John relates to the churches. Again, it's, it's painting an image for us. It would have painted a clearer image for them, I'm convinced. Um, and verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands nor give up, and I'm going to insert false worship, worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. And, uh, nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Now, this guy has a pretty dismal view of human nature. Or, or an accurate view of, of the context of Asia Minor. Yeah. And certainly these, these verses, uh, verses 20 um, and 21, it seemed to uh, parallel what we know of Asia Minor. In Acts 19, for example, uh, right. the, worship, the false worship of Artemis, um, mm-hmm. the, the making of idols that we see in Acts 19, the sorcery that is present in that city as well. And here the people remain obstinate in spite of the disastrous things that are happening. Um, they, they do not repent. They continue in their uh, prior practices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he was speaking their language. He he understood that they were that he was speaking to them and the people in their area, their region, and of course, there's universal application as well to all mankind, but particularly to the Asians in uh, the ancient Near East. This is a challenging passage. Um, and, you, and you can read this. I mean, when you read it, you can see how somebody might walk away and say, oh, wow, that sounds like modern war uh, that's happening here. Um, there's fire and there's smoke, there's sulfur. Uh, that you, can, you can just see somebody imagining uh, modern weapons and so on uh, th- that are taking place here. But, but is that what we should take away from this passage? I don't think it is. And 
again, I, I would say that because this other half, less, a little less than half of the trumpets are not addressing uh, from an earthly perspective, but from a heavenly perspective. And so what John sees, he's seeing from the perspective of the heavens, from a cosmic perspective. So it's not necessarily that's what people on earth would see. Uh, maybe he's merely giving it a name, as it were, but he's giving us a description of uh, judgments that are the result of not just humanity's disobedience, but also disobedient angels who are playing a part, but they themselves, uh, who they themselves will come under judgment as well, as we will see as we get further along in Revelation. And I know you alluded to it earlier, but we, you know, the final two verses, um, you know, in a sense, it, it is tied to what we read in Acts 19 due to Paul's preaching. Uh, we get people repenting of these things, but here they are not. Mm -hmm. They just dig in their heels, their hearts harden like Pharaoh. would also note that in those last two verses of chapter 9, verses 20 and 21, that we have the, the two marks of paganism. Mm -hmm. idolatry and immorality. Mm -hmm. And I would contrast that with what I believe are the distinguishing marks of the Christ follower, purity and integrity. Now, I, I know uh, I should say charity and uh, faith and hope, but I do think the distinctive outward marks that we see of God's people are purity and integrity, and that's a direct contrast to the primary characteristics of pagans, or in our own generation, uh, neo-pagans, uh, which mm -hmm. is all around us, uh, very evident to see. Um, up until recently, you didn't hear the word moral used in common discourse. It wasn't until the the last administration that we began to hear echoes of the word moral and morality and so so and so is not fit for office and doesn't matter which side of the political spectrum you're on both would use the same argument uh but suddenly morality has become very much in vogue uh so much so that people are telling us that if you are uh a certain person, then you are are de facto immoral, uh, and we hear different arguments of um, morality all around us uh, to say something like, "If if you don't agree with this group or with that group, then you're a racist, and that's immoral, and you need to be re-educated, and you need to." Uh, you need to change, and you need to get on the right side of history. So, you know, things like uh, immorality and idolatry and integrity and purity are very much at issue in the world in which we live today. Mm -hmm. And we need to find a way to speak to it. And I think, you know, this passage, uh, this uh, this plague, this sixth trumpet judgment, uh, certainly speaks to us in our day as much as it spoke to them in the first generation that heard this. And then how does, how do you see chapter 10 fitting into this context? We have John now uh, again seeing uh, another mighty angel coming down wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head and his face was like the sun and his legs like pillars of fire. And he had a little scroll open in his hand and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land and called out with a loud voice like a roaring lion when he called out the seven thunders sounded and when the seven thunders had sounded i was about to write but i heard a voice from heaven saying seal up 
what the seven thunders have said, and do not write it down. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land raised his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and what is in it, the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, is in it. And there would be no more delay, but in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. This is he had announced to his servants, his prophets. Yeah, in, in a way, I see a little bit of teasing going on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, by that, I mean, what do we, what are we getting set up for? What are we going to expect to see? We're, we're moving awfully close to, man, is the end here yet? You know, aren't we nearing the end yet? Is, is this not the end of the ages? And yet we have something, as, as I look forward to verse 11, of what happened in verse 7 uh, in, in chapter 7. Uh, just as we had the sealing of the 144,000 or a great multitude who have their security uh, by virtue of their faith in Christ, who made their, blood, their robes, uh, washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, now we're going to be introduced once again. Uh, to a heavenly scene, sort of a recapitulation, take this scroll, eat it. But then very soon after that, we have this introduction of two special witnesses. So, you know, we have this tension between heaven and earth, between the gospel being preached and a witness being given. And so it feels a little bit like a tease to me. I'm not seeing quite what I expected to see. Mm -hmm. And so how would you then tease that out? (laughs) Well, I think for one thing, we're, you know, as Don mentioned, this is something of a recapitulation. So this angel, whoever he may be or she, for all that matter, uh, I guess it says he set his foot, so him, uh, he is is something of an expression of God's sovereignty over all of creation, land and water, but also the heavens having come down from heaven. And, you know, we don't know exactly what is written on the scroll, but clearly it is important or he wouldn't be holding it. And what's more that the John is going to write these things down that the, the angel spoke uh, and is told not to. Okay, so there's the tease, right? But what comes next, in a sense, moves the the narrative forward because of what John is told to do. The same voice tells him to go to that angel and and take the scroll and eat it. And it's interesting that the angel tells him, eat it and it will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth, it will taste like honey. It will be sweet like honey. And isn't this the gospel message? Hmm. You know, it is sweet. Taste and see that the Lord is good. But the bitterness is that not all will receive it. Hmm you may in fact experience persecution and rejection as a result. And I think, you know, not to jump too far ahead, but we see this then in a sense recapitulated in the history of the church from the time of Christ's ascension to his return in the appearance of the two witnesses. You know, I, I, I would agree with you, David. I, I mean, that's what I see here. Um, yeah. You know, putting this in we're in the context of where we are, we're we're in the sixth uh, trumpet. Um, mm-hmm. We've already established in the sixth seal that the church is still present on mm-hmm. earth, and so um, a- and we know that the gospel is still being proclaimed. We see we've seen already that there was a repentance of some mm-hmm. um, who then gave glory to God. Um, and, and so there seems to still be at this moment, 
a gospel presence that's being mm-hmm. proclaimed. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've wondered as well, is that what this scroll is? Uh, that, that this is the gospel message. Yes, it is sweet to us who have received it, but it will be bitter for those who have not. Um, and, and even perhaps the bitterness is is uh, a part of the persecution that those who are proclaiming the gospel will experience. That this and is not may, an easy task. Yeah, it may also be bitterness in terms of feeling compassion for these people who reject it. Mm. There's a, a bitterness that we know their fate. Yeah. They will be judged. A, another viewpoint on this, and that perhaps this is the same scroll that we saw in chapter 5 that's introduced or introduced in chapter 4. Let me just look back and see. The scroll with the seven seals. Yeah, introduced in chapter 5. And I know that it says that, uh, get on the right page here, he had a little scroll open in his hand. So it's a different designation. Um, But is there sweetness in that the prayers of the saints are being answered and they're being vindicated? But there's bitterness in it, in that even more Christians are going to die. And certainly, uh, many more of those who, up to a third or a great number, more than the fourth uh, mentioned in uh, the chapter mm-hmm. six. But, you know, bitter in, in that, that, you know, more people are going to die. And then he gives this call in verse 11. And I was told, you must again prophesy about many peoples and nations and languages and kings. So it is, I think, tied in with this uh, prophecy against the nations, to the nations, and for the nations, uh, but we know there's going to be continued rebellion. So th- there's just another viewpoint, and I'm not saying that it is the scroll, but it it could be because we have the continual unfolding and intensification of the contents of the scroll from chapter 4 revealed uh, in the trumpets of Uh, chapter 8 and 9. Yeah, you know, I might uh, agree there, Don. I think what um, compels me is verse 7, that in the days of the trumpet call to be sounded by the seventh angel, the mystery of God would be fulfilled. And I just see that as a clear reference to to uh, what John knew would be fulfilled. And that was that the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles uh, were coming into the kingdom together. Um, that, that was the language of, of Paul, as I referred to a while ago in Ephesians 3, 6 and Colossians 2. Um, that this mystery is going to be completed. And, and it seems to me then that verse 11, um, is is uh, is a part of that. Um, again, John is told to prophesy, and to whom should he be prophesying? It, and it, and you know, if we agree that this is a uh, a letter written to the seven churches, I think the prophecy is to them. Look, it, this mystery is going to be complete. And here is the prophecy that I'll once again say to you that I've already said in chapter four, verse nine, uh, in or I mean, chapter five, verse nine and chapter seven, uh, verse nine. I'm going to say it one more time that, uh, that this is about the many peoples, the nations, the languages and the kings. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it's a, uh, I mean, in a sense. The book of Revelation is living up to its name, right? The mystery is about to be completely revealed. It's not, it's not a secret. It's going to be made known to all of creation. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. Those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. There will be no uh, nowhere in all of creation and no person 
alive or dead, because the dead will be raised, where they will not, how do I put this? They will not be able to do anything but affirm and acknowledge the person of Jesus as the son of God, Mm -hmm. the savior of the world. They will still reject him, those who are of the world, but they will not be able to resist acknowledging who he is based on everything that has come before and then his majestic presence at the end. So we have all these, these illusions and these clues and these, uh, in many cases, clear statements. It's building up to that. And then we get into chapter 11. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, I think this is why this also compels me to a, a perspective that this this is in reference to the continued proclamation of the gospel. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, we have the mystery here of God. We have Jesus present in chapter 10 as well. Um, he is the one who lives forever, who created heaven and what's in it and earth and what's in it and the sea and what's in it and so on. We have this prophecy. I, it, it seems to me that, uh, that John is being told by the angel that, you know, remind the churches uh, that this is going to happen. This, it's, a, it's a given. Uh, God has uh, ordained that this is going to happen. Uh, that one day all uh, that one day there will be many peoples and nations and languages uh, before the throne worshiping. And then chapter 11, um, we have the two witnesses and, uh, and, and boy, there's a lot here that, uh, that needs to be unpacked. And I think we have to leave that for uh, next week. But I do want to just conclude with, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in verse 13 of chapter 11, there does this seem to be some hope here um, that is brought by the gospel, by these two witnesses, that there will be some who give glory to God in heaven in the midst of the destruction that's that's happening. And I, And that might go back to what we've alluded to previously. That this is a message of encouragement for the church, of uh, a reminder to those who, as uh, as uh, the third century Bishop Victorinus uh, said, that the, those who were Christians in name only, that there's still opportunity to repent, uh, to come and be right with God. And, and then as well as the notion of God uh, and his patience desiring for even more to come into relationship with him. But we're going to leave these topics for our next session and um, and hope that uh, as you are wrestling through the book of Revelation, that increasingly you're seeing Jesus here, just as uh, John is seeing him as well. So for David and Don and myself, we're grateful that you're joining us on this journey through the book of Revelation and look forward to being with you next week. 